everybody. Um, I wanted to begin this week with a little bit of background about the film we're going to watch, uh, Night in Fog. Uh, as, I, as I noted in an email last week, um, it's available on the Moodle page, uh, just uh, posted right underneath the quiz for, for next week under the Second World War week. Um, you can also rent this on iTunes. It's three dollars um, and the quality is just a lot better. Um, I couldn't find a free version with spectacular quality, um, but it'll do if, uh, if, if you're not interested in spending the $3, it's perfectly fine and I totally understand that. Um, as I mentioned as well in the email, this film was produced um, just 10 years after the war, um, after the concentration camps and death camps had been liberated uh, in 1945. Uh, and the title itself, Night and Fog, comes from a German wartime order uh, dated December 7th, 1941, which is also, of course, as many of you probably know, uh, Pearl Harbor Day in the US. Um, the so-called Night and Fog Order, which gave the German SS, uh, the sort of secret police of the Nazi regime, uh, the power to arrest, imprison, or execute any man, woman, child uh, suspected of endangering the German war effort and those arrested under uh, this order were said to have disappeared, said to have vanished into the night and the fog. Um, the film's director, Alain René, uh, collaborated with survivors in the making of the film. So the screenwriter, um, Jean Cairol, was imprisoned at a concentration camp. The score was composed by Hans Eisler, who was an Austrian Jew um, who had escaped the Nazis in the early uh, 1930s for Hollywood. Um, at the time that he was working on this film, he was actually blacklisted in Hollywood um, for suspected communist sympathies. So he had experienced um, the sort of alienation of the state in multiple ways during his life. There are many, uh, many obviously films about the Holocaust. I'm sure everybody in this class has seen at least one. Uh, many of these are big budget blockbuster films. Many of these are very sort of high drama films, award-winning films. Um, it's sort of a classic subject of filmmaking, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Um, but Night and Fog is frequently regarded as the sort of most profound uh, and most aesthetically powerful of all of them, um, even though it's very short, right? It's only 32 minutes. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this is that Rene uh, avoids a lot of the common pitfalls or a lot of the sort of standard approaches to, to uh, discussing the Holocaust or depicting the Holocaust in film. Um, most importantly, he doesn't turn it into a melodrama, right? Um, there are no characters, right? There's no protagonist uh, that we can identify with and follow through the film. Um, there's only a narrator uh, who, like us, is trying and often failing uh, to make sense of what we're seeing. Um, the visual evidence has to speak for itself. The visual evidence in this film um, is a lot more raw. It's a lot more graphic than much of what we see in more sort of recent, more mainstream uh, sort of Hollywood depictions of the Holocaust. This is a far more gruesome film. Um, in this sense, Night and Fog ends up being something like an anti-documentary, right? Uh, it doesn't take, like most documentaries would take evidence and then weave that evidence into a kind of coherent narrative so that we leave and we've got greater understanding of a subject. We, we leave and we know like, okay, here's what the, the director, uh, the screenwriter wanted us to take away from this thing. Um, but Night and Fog doesn't necessarily do that. Right? At times the narrator simply says, it's useless to describe what went on or words are insufficient. It's not in that way. The Holocaust becomes not just another topic that we can master and sort of control and understand and say, okay, here's what I learned from this. It's instead almost futile to try and understand the depths of the horror um, of the death camps. It's insufficient certainly to describe it. Um, and yet we still have to grapple with the task of trying to remember what happened there, right? So this is a very complicated approach uh, to filmmaking and storytelling. 
Um, it's revolutionary in a way, and it has to be because the Holocaust itself um, does not fit within the sort of ordinary spectrum of human events. It's sort of beyond the pale. Um, okay, so I'll look forward to talking about this film with you um, in the week ahead. So let's move on to um, discussing the Holocaust in greater detail. And then in the second half of this lecture, I'm gonna talk about the war itself. Um, the, the Brooks textbook gives you some great background on the war on the Western Front, um, which is as Americans, the, the part of the Second World War that we're generally more familiar with. Um, the war is fought by the Western allies, certainly Britain and, uh, and at least parts of France, the parts of France that weren't uh, conquered or totally under the sway of the Nazi regime. Um, and then after 1941 as well by the US. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, or sorry, instead of focusing on the Western Front in the lecture today, I want to focus on the Eastern Front, a part of the war that we don't uh, learn as much about in the US typically, um, but actually where the vast majority um, at least in Europe of the fighting was taking place um, and where by far the vast majority of uh, casualties uh, were. Uh, so we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Before we do that, I wanna just go into a little bit more background about the road in Nazi Germany to the Holocaust, how we get there. Um, and Brooks gives you some helpful background on some of this as well in chapter 11. Um, totalitarian regimes, as we discussed uh, last week, are fundamentally revolutionary. Okay, I think that's a really important, important point to keep in mind. A totalitarian regime must achieve a complete social, cultural, and political and economic revolution. All right, the, the basic order of everyday life has to be subverted, has to be completely changed. Um, and that's because they need to forcibly impose their ideology onto the world, right? They have to transform the world um, into their ideal image by exploiting the fullest powers of the state or creating new powers of the state. So when we think of totalitarianism in the Nazi context, we have to see Nazi anti-Semitism, um, right? The Nazi hatred of Jews. Um, culminating in the extermination of Jews, as well as Slavs and many other groups that I'm gonna talk about in a few moments, as one crucial part uh, of this overall effort to remake the world, to create a new world um, that is uh, in with the founding ideology, okay? Um, and once in power, um, the Nazis quickly begin this project. Okay, they quickly start working towards this project of remaking the world. Um, here's what uh, we can see. We can see that, that this sort of seeps into everyday life here. Children, these, are, these children are members of uh, the Hitler Youth. They're sewing uniforms for the military and we see the sort of all seeing uh, image of uh, the Fuhrer above them. Um, it is not enough to reconcile people more or less to our regime. That's what Joseph Goebbels, uh, the Nazi minister of propaganda said. We want rather to work on people until they are addicted to us, right? This is that process of pulling all of social and political and economic life into the sway of the regime. There is no part of life in Germany um, in the later 1930s and certainly in the 1940s um, that exists outside of the Nazis' control. Okay, we want to work on people until they are addicted to us. And this is Joseph Goebbels, by the way. Um, he is the man here, he's holding one of his daughters. He's in the suit at the bottom. And these are all of his children and his wife. This, this guy at the top is uh, his oldest son who was actually, this picture was taken during the war. His son was off in the war um, and sort of an early version of Photoshopping. He superimposed into the picture to make it seem like he was actually there. Um, but here's Goebbels as a sort of traditional family man 
Um, so throughout the 1930s, we see Nazi ideology saturating German culture everywhere, right? The SS battalions, the secret police battalions, parade through cities. Um, loudspeakers blare Nazi bulletins. Um, all work stops to hear the Fuhrer speak. Um, the Fuhrer's portrait, as we saw in that image of the children, is everywhere. Um, his portrait is on all of the postage stamps. Um, it's in living rooms. Um, you see images like uh, here on our right, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Fuhrer, one people, one empire, one leader, right? This sort of um, sloganeering dominates German culture. And Joseph Goebbels, right? He connects with the nation's school teachers. He creates the new curriculum for the, for the nation's schools. He reminds school teachers it is not their job, as he put it, to determine whether or not something is true. Okay, teachers and any intellectual worker is no longer charged with that task. You're not here to discern the truth, but whether it is in the spirit of the Nazi revolution, right? Everything must support this broader idea of the revolution of completely overturning the old order and creating something totally new. And woven into this propaganda assault that's just completely inescapable, just everywhere, is hatred of Jews. Nazi propaganda depicted Jews as an other. You might hear this term every once in a while. Um, and essentially what it means is it's a group of people who are so different uh, that they are not able to be assimilated into the wider population. So Jews are others. They can't become German. They're defined by their otherness, by their difference, and they will never overcome that difference. And their characteristics, as the propaganda would have, uh, would have it, are greed, avarice, um, sexual predation. We read some of this in the primary sources uh, in Mein Kampf, for example. Um, but also an ability to sort of mastermind uh, and undermine um, German uh, culture, right? To mastermind the overthrow of German culture, to undermine German culture. Um, that's this, Im this image is a little later. This is from during the war, I think it's 1943. But what it's saying is that the war is the fault of the Jews, right? Which is, we know, completely absurd, right? Hitler was essentially begging uh, his enemies to go to war with him. As I'm going to show later in this lecture, he very intentionally invades the Soviet Union to provoke a war. He very intentionally invades Poland, recognizing that it will likely provoke war with Britain and France, right? But the, the sort of the madness of Nazi anti-Semitism is to depict all of the problems that fall on the people as the responsibility of the Jews, even though it's very clear uh, that the Jews by the mid 1940s or by the early 1940s, I suppose, um, are completely ostracized, right? It's impossible that this could be the case. And yet it can be believed because it is so widely, this idea is so widely, uh, uh, disseminated. Um, what's important to keep in mind as well, when we think about Nazi anti-Semitism, is that Jews were a very small portion of the German population, smaller than, in fact, most other European countries. Um, they were less than 1% of the overall population, about 570,000 Jewish people in Germany. Uh, when the Nazis came to power, despite the fact that they're a tiny minority, um, they're an incredibly powerful scapegoat for the Nazi regime, right? Um, the Nazis can use the idea of Jews, even though there's very few actual Jews in Germany, to incite fear. Uh, and that means to cultivate loyalty, right? We have an enemy within. You must be loyal to us so that we can prevent um, this enemy from taking over. Um, and so we see images like this, right? Comparing Jews to sort of an infectious disease, uh, a germ that lives amongst us. And one of the most important early 
uh, moves against uh, Jews within Germany is the Nuremberg race laws of 1935. And Brooks talks a little bit about these as well, uh, which declared that Jews are not a religious group. Um, Judaism is not a religion. They are instead a racial group, right? Um, a Jew is legally defined as any person with at least three Jewish grandparents. And this is significant because what it means is that one cannot renounce their Judaism, right? It's not like a religion and you can say, oh, no, I'm not that anymore. I'm going to convert and I'm now going to be a Christian, right? That's not possible. You can't renounce this scientific, right, uh, as they would have it, scientifically proven racial identity. Um, you can never claim to be something else. No one can convert. Um, so that it is impossible to be redeemed. Um, and this is setting the groundwork very early uh, in the regime, right? Hitler only came to power in 33, so this is 35. It's setting the groundwork for a situation in which Jews must be uh, eliminated entirely. And that's where we're going to go um, by the very early 1940s. Um, those same Nuremberg laws, they deprive Jews of their citizenship. Uh, reclassify them as subjects of the Reich. They are no longer citizens of Germany. They are subjects of the German Reich, um, which means they can be monitored at all times. They have to carry internal paperwork, internal password, uh, passports. They can be stopped by police at any level, at any moment. Um, and they can be charged with crimes, but never sort of alerted to what those charges are with very little hope of hearing, uh, of having a trial um, that they can uh, prove their innocence. They're prohibited from practicing their professions. Uh, doctors, lawyers, musicians, professors um, are all fired uh, if they're Jewish. They're banned from public spaces, um, so they can no longer go to hospitals. Uh, they can't go to museums, theaters, restaurants, schools. Um, they're banned from marrying non-Jewish uh, people. Um, it is a crime to have sex with a non-Jewish person. Um, and these laws really eviscerated Jewish civil rights entirely. Okay, so Jewish participation in German life um, is dramatically, fundamentally, permanently altered by these Nuremberg race laws. And Jews themselves are transformed into pariahs right? A pariah is another word for another, right? Outcasts in their own country. Remember, these people are born, almost entirely born, live their entire lives in Germany, are just fully part of German life and culture. Many Jews had fought for Germany during the First World War. Many had been um, instrumental in the governance of Germany during the Weimar Republic, right? This isn't like um, a, pe a group of people who are somehow new to Germany. They've been there for thousands of years, and suddenly they are outcasts. Um, in response, we see from about 33, but especially after 35, until about 1938, um, about 25% of the country's Jewish population emigrates, uh, a move that the Nazis themselves um, don't make easy, but also don't necessarily oppose, right? It's a solution in a sense to their problem. Uh, as they see it, their problem being that they have a Jewish population at all. Um, why didn't more? I think this is a really common question that we all ask. And when we learn this material, it's, it's common to put ourselves into this position. What would happen? What would it be like to be the victim of this kind um, uh, of legal ostracization, legal um, oppression? Right. What would I do? Uh, would I leave? Well, I think many of us, knowing where this story goes, would say, of course, you'd do anything to get away. Um, but 75% of Germany's Jews did not for a number of reasons. One, it's really expensive. It's, it's not easy um, to become an expatriate, to leave your country and immigrate around the world. It's a very hard thing to do. It's much harder to do when you have a whole family, right? When we're talking about small children, when we're talking about elderly parents, when we're talking about siblings, um, it's very hard to pick that up and leave, 
Um, Jews were prohibited from taking their belongings uh, with them. In most cases, they were prohibited from taking their money and their wealth. They had to have support abroad, um, pretty skilled legal support abroad to shelter uh, their resources somehow and protect a even a little bit of their wealth um, before leaving. And most were unable to do that. Um, you needed connections abroad, right? Not only to protect your resources, but also to get somewhere. You needed someone to vouch for you. You needed institutions abroad, powerful people abroad um, to, to intervene on your behalf and find a place for you, whether you're going to Britain or the United States or where have you. Um, so we see people like Hannah Arendt, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, right, very prominent, all of them are academics, They're very prominent people, they have connections with institutions abroad, usually with universities, um, and with other influential intellectuals who can help them get away. Um, but for most people, they don't have that, right? Most of us don't have those kinds of connections abroad. Um, it's sort of an exceptional thing. Um, and another issue is that there's not a lot of enthusiasm among foreign powers for accepting these uh, Jewish refugees. So it's very difficult um, to leave uh, and most Jews are trapped. Um, in the same year, um, 1938, right, that uh, as much as 25% of the country's Jewish population has emigrated, in that same year, we see a shift in legal oppression um, from the sort of laws of the Nuremberg laws, which are sort of tightening the boundaries of Jewish life. Um, we see a shift from that towards outright violence. Um, and this uh, is most notably, this occurs um, on the night of November 9th, 1938, when Nazi gangs across the country um, spearheaded anti-Jewish riots um, they kill more than 100 Jews. They burn hundreds of synagogues, uh, thousands and thousands of businesses. They smash uh, windows um, and home, the, the windows of businesses and homes. And those, that broken glass gives this event its name, Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. Um, and the Nazi state then confiscated Jewish land and businesses across the country. And this is, this is especially sadistic. Um, they say they have to confiscate the land to make the Jews pay for all the damage that's been done, right? So this is, you brutalize a victim and then you blame the victim for the violence that's befallen them, right? Uh, and say, how are you gonna pay for this? Look at all the destroyed property we have. Look at all the resources we've had to expend putting these fires out on your behalf. Who's gonna pay for all of this? Um, uh, and so they confiscate Jewish territory to do that. Um, soon after Kristallnacht, we see um, Jews begin to be arrested en masse uh, for, the, for the crime of being Jewish, which has shifted towards an explicit, a, a crime against the state, right? It is a crime to just be this person. Here we see um, an especially brutal and sadistic moment. Um, these are Jews crowded into a synagogue to hear a reading of Mein Kampf from uh, the pulpit. Um, at the same time, all of this is happening, Nazis are also targeting other groups. So they declare homosexuality a sickness. Um, it's estimated that the Nazis killed about 200,000 German gays. Um, as early as 1933, they begin forcibly sterilizing gypsies, um, the mentally handicapped, the physically handicapped, um, children of mixed race parentage, really anybody that they can deem um, imperfect, right? Anybody whose existence is a threat to their ideology. Um, and they also begin um, uh, euthanizing the handicapped by the, the middle of the 1930s, right? Simply putting people to death. Um, they frame these policies in racial terms, but also economic terms, right? So this poster, for example, says um, 60,000 Reichsmarks. This is what this person suffering from hereditary defects costs the community 
of Germans during his lifetime, fellow citizen, that is your money too, right? Suggesting um, that these people are a drain on the economic vitality of the so-called German community, okay? Uh, the German community can only be those who can also uh, contribute in a way that the, the Reich sees as appropriate. Um, and anybody else is not a member of the community. And so they must increasingly be ostracized or uh, liquidated. And all of this draws on social Darwinist ideas, right? The Nazis are proclaiming that imperfection is not only a drain on national strength right now in the 1930s, right? But they are thinking into the future and they're saying it will forever be a drain. Right? This will weaken us uh, for generations to come unless we eliminate these people now. Okay, so they are thinking about national power in the 30s and national power for centuries, millennia to come. All of this um, takes on greater urgency during the war. Um, right? Most of what I just described is occurring between 1933 when Hitler becomes chancellor in 1938, uh, which is when the international crisis is really intensifying. And we see, um, uh, for example, the Anschluss, uh, in which Austria is forcibly made a part of greater Germany. Um, and we see uh, the annexation of the Sudetenland there, uh, Western Czechoslovakia. All of that is also happening in 38. And as um, I said last week, the war really begins in 39 with the invasion of Poland. Um, and so it's not like the Nazis go to war and think, okay, we've got all these racial laws, we're putting all this energy of the state into purifying the German people, purifying our society. We need to focus on the war now though, right? And shift those resources. They never do that. They always maintain an intense material um, and uh, labor commitment to purification, which suggests just how deep this ideology ran um, in Nazi culture. Um, so one of the reasons it becomes even more urgent, they become even more energetically hateful and murderous during the war, is that the Lebensraum policy, right, the living room policy, expansion to the East, um, the conquest of Eastern Europe, that Hitler's been fantasizing about since the 1920s, um, as they actually begin accomplishing those goals, what they're doing is they're bringing millions of Jews under the control of uh, the German government, right? Um, the conquest of Poland alone, uh, beginning in 1939, meant that roughly 2 million Jews now lived under Nazi authority right? Very few Jews who lived in Germany at the time uh, of Hitler's rise to power. The vast majority of Europe's Jews lived in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Um, so as they expand east, uh, that is going to intensify uh, the Nazi war on uh, the Jewish people. Okay. Um, as the German armies um, sweep through Central and Eastern Europe, beginning in 1939, um, they mobilize these uh, elite killing units, units whose job is to just murder civilians, um, called the Einsatzgruppen. Um, and the Einsatzgruppen massacred tens of thousands of Jews and Poles and Lithuanians and Ukrainians and Belarusians. Um, in cold blood, right? Uh, this is early in the war. This is 1940, 1941. Uh, and at first, this is just the solution. This is how the Nazi war machine is going to uh, depopulate Eastern Europe, uh, particularly of its Jews, just through sort of mass murder. Um, and But what happens is the commanders of these death squads, and remember, these are elite soldiers, Right. Uh, the commanders of these death squads, they're reporting back to Berlin. They're saying the mass murder is, is quite difficult for their men. Right. It's wearing on them psychologically, uh, but also it's very time intensive. 
right? It, it takes an enormous amount of time and resources to sweep through communities and simply just shoot and murder everybody. Um, and for a regime that says obsessed with efficiency and productivity, as the Nazis are, this is a problem. We need to depopulate this vast swath of territory, but how can we do it in the most efficient way possible? And this leads to a meeting of Nazi leaders in the town of Wannsee, which is just outside Berlin. And it's here at this villa that you can see here. It's a very stately classic uh, building. They decide on a more efficient means of solving the so-called Jewish problem, uh, which is extermination. Uh, to be coordinated by the SS, um, the state security. And this is known as the so-called final solution. Okay, so you begin in the mid thirties with legal circumscription of Jewish rights and uh, the eventual abolition of all Jewish civil rights. And then you move to sort of uh, terrorism on Kristallnacht uh, and mass violence and arson. Um, and then you move to sort of mass murder as carried out by the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, and then we now have the sort of uh, the last stage, the final solution, which is extermination that's going to be coordinated and organized and efficient. Uh, and this occurs between 1942 and 1945. Um, in those uh, years, Jews from across Europe not obviously just Germany um, and no longer even just Eastern Europe, but also Jews from any part of Europe that is now allied with the Nazis or, or sort of under the coercion of the Nazis. So from throughout France and Italy as well, um, uh, Jews are uh, sent to concentration camps um, as well as increasingly to uh, death camps extermination camps, which are not the same thing as a concentration camp. Um, they are sent to places like Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, Sobibor, uh, Chelmno, Majdanek, and uh, most famous Auschwitz. And most of these camps, I've tried to underline, this, this map shows all of the concentration camps in Europe, um, but I've tried as well to underline uh, the death camps. And you can see where they are, right? So here's Germany. Um, obviously, this is France and Italy. But the death camps are all in the east. They're all, uh, most of them are in Poland. Um, and here we have uh, one as well in Belarus. Um, why is this? Why are they all there? Um, well, it's, it's most basically because that's where Europe's Jews lived. They lived in the East um, and Nazis were concerned with making this an, as efficient process as possible. And so they build the death camps where their enemies, where their targets are. Jews are taken from their homes um, or they're taken from increasingly from concentration camps, which are sort of like holding prisons uh, prior to the death camp. Um, uh, and they're told that they're being resettled that they will be resettled in new land somewhere else. They're crammed into cattle cars like these in the background, um, which I'm sure many of you have seen these cars before. And upon arrival at the death camps, they encounter one of the Nazi slogans, um, a hideously ironic slogan, Arbeit macht frei, uh, which means uh, work shall make you free, right? Obviously no one would be free again as long as the Nazis had anything to say about it. Um, new arrivals are called freight, right? Which is a, is a sort of dehumanizing term. You aren't a person, you are merely freight like any other good, any other commodity that could be traded. They're separated into one group of the relatively fit who then are going to become the slave laborers of these camps uh, and the camp factories until they lose all of their strength and then they will be exterminated. Um, and another group uh, that is predominantly young children, the elderly, um, who are sent immediately to extermination. Um, after their murder victims were piled up um, outside the chambers, as you saw uh, in Night and Fog, prisoners forced to harvest items of value uh, 
uh, from the corpses, gold teeth, hair, eyeglasses, shoes, etc. cetera. Um, and then those items were cataloged very, uh, in sort of very carefully in great detail um, and then shipped back to Germany to support the war effort. And this is an immense amount of raw material. Um, in the 10 months, just 10 months from 1942 into 1943, Treblinka, one of the larger um, death camps, sent 25 freight cars of human hair. 25 freight cars of human hair to Berlin. It sent 100 freight cars of shoes, 400,000 cars of watches, 320,000 pounds of wedding rings, um, and all of this is then reappropriated and turned into material to support the Nazi war effort. Um, following gassing, corpses are burned in specially designed crematoriums. Crematoriums, by the way, that were designed by um, large industrial corporations that had existed prior to the Nazi regime and had made their peace with the Nazis and were in the interest of, in doing good business. Um, uh, and, and thought very carefully about how they could most efficiently burn uh, human bodies, right? So this is the sort of the factory ideal, the same ideals that would exist for building cars, um, the same ideals that would exist for building anything in an industrialized society apply as well to mass murder. Um, at Auschwitz alone, as many as 1.5 million uh, men, women, and children were killed. 90% of those were Jews. Um, I think it's important to, to ask what we can say about the perpetrators, right? How can we make sense of the people who did all of this? And this is a question that Night and Fog poses to us as well. Okay, who could possibly have done this to their fellow human beings? Um, these are guards at Sobibor in Eastern Poland. Um, without a doubt, many of the SS officers who coordinated and organized and made this happen were fanatics, right? They were fanatical racists. Um, they were sadists who took great delight uh, in human misery. Uh, they were cold-blooded ideologues. They believed uh, wholeheartedly in Hitler's program and they wanted uh, to exterminate lesser people to make the world a better place as they saw it. Um, many were common criminals who were taken from prisons and put into concentration camps. Um, but there were never enough of these kinds of maniacs to actually make this thing run, to actually make the Holocaust what it was, right? So it's not enough for us to just say, oh, they just, there were just a ton of psychopaths in Nazi Germany and the lands that it conquered to the East. Um, I think what's really essential to take away and what really shocked allied observers as they began liberating the camps uh, was that so many Einsatzgruppen and SS officers, so many desk camp workers, medical professionals, etc., who work in these camps, were ordinary. These are the guards um, of Auschwitz, right? The, by far the most famous uh, and most deadly of all of the camps. These are the perpetrators. Um, many of them were working class. Um, very few had a criminal history, actually. Um, very few actually had particularly strong ideological commitments. Um, most were not members of the Nazi party, never joined, or if they did join, it was only after 1938 when, uh, when it was essentially compulsory, right? Um, as the Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi wrote, um, he was an Italian survivor, um, monsters exist but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the functionaries, ready to believe and to act without asking questions, right? So these are people who in another lifetime, they might've worked in an office or they might've built cars. Uh, they might've worked in restaurants, what have you. They were just normal people um, who accepted what uh, more powerful people told them to do and just did it. Um, Hannah Arendt, who we talked about last week, the theorist of totalitarianism, um, called this the banality of evil, right? Banality meaning the sort of unthinking, sort of crass, base, sort of stupid, uh, 
ordinary nature of evil. Um, evil isn't always plotting. It's not always twirling its mustache. Um, evil doesn't always look necessarily like evil, right? It can be Hitler. It can be the strong man, the maniac. Um, but it can also be a man like Adolf Eichmann. Okay, this is Adolf Eichmann here. He looks like um, an insurance salesman, right? He looks sort of like a history professor. Um, he's a small man. He's a neatly dressed man um, who works feverishly to please his bosses. Um, and in the process, Eichmann presides over the systematic mass killing of 11 million people, right? Eichmann is the sort of planner. Um, of the Holocaust. He's the one who figures out how people are going to get to where they are and how they will be killed most efficiently. Um, evil uh, in this context is proper. It's polished. It's prompt. It's organized. It's efficient and it's effective. It gets its job done without asking questions. Um, so there's a lot of tragedy in human history. There's a lot of suffering. Uh, there's a lot of violence. What makes the Holocaust unique? This is an important question for us to grapple with. Um, and I think first, it is the determination um, to completely exterminate these populations, the targeted populations, right? The totality, the scope of the genocide of the Holocaust is essentially incomparable. There's nothing, there's nothing really like this. Uh, in the history of the world. There are obviously many genocides. There are many attempts to wipe people from the earth, but there's nothing uh, that matches this scale or the speed of the Holocaust. Um, two thirds of Europe's Jews died. Um, tens of thousands of families are completely wiped from the face of the earth without a trace. Um, the Jewish population of the entire continent uh, goes from the sort of large Europe at the time of the Holocaust is the center of, of Jewish culture in the world, right? There are millions and millions of Jews in Europe. Um, and in the post-war period, um, there are very, very few left, right? They're either murdered or they're forced to leave and they never obviously return. Um, the, the other, I think, unique aspect of the Holocaust, the thing that makes it stand out is the systematic and industrial way in which it took place. Um, this is factory efficiency. Uh, it's built upon, it really is modeled upon the insights of Adam Smith, who we read about at the beginning of the semester, Henry Ford, right? The great American um, car builder. Um, it's taking their ideas about how to build a pin or how to build a car or build any other sort of common item in life efficiently and applying those ideas to mass murder. Okay, and that, um, that sort of hyper modern form of human cruelty uh, stands out in the history of, of human violence. Um, okay, as I said, looking forward to discussing all of these issues with you in the week ahead. So let's talk about uh, the war itself for a little bit here. Uh, let's pivot to the battlefield. Um, remember last time I discussed the onset of the Second World War. Um, we're talking about the Nazi invasion of Poland in 1939. We're talking about the declarations of war against Germany by Britain and France, and then the Nazis quickly conquer France as well. Um, I'm going to spend most of this lecture, however, exploring the Eastern Front. Um, this, this, and when we talk about the Eastern Front, what we mean is the Second World War essentially as it played out in the battle between Stalin's Soviet Union and Hitler, Hitler's Nazi Germany. Uh, and this is a war that takes place from the sort of Eastern borders of Germany, all through Eastern Europe, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, etc., Latvia, all the way to um, far into Russia. Okay. Um, and in the US, uh, I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, but the story of the war is often told from the perspective of the American Japanese effort, which is obviously huge and essential and horrific. Um, 
or the US and British combined effort against the Germans in Western Europe, right? The war has took place in, from North Africa into Italy and then through France, Belgium, et cetera, and into Western Germany. Um, and that's obviously really important stuff and Brooks gives us some good information about that. Um, but I think an issue arises because a lot of Americans don't really know much about the Eastern Front, right? Um, it's very easy to overlook it because there's, there's no real American presence there. There's not much Western European presence on the Eastern Front. Um, so it's just not really part of our history of the Second World War. And I think that's unfortunate um, because it's, it's, well, for one, it's the largest theater of warfare in the history of the world. Um, uh, but also this is really where the Second World War, at least in Europe, was fought. Um, far more, uh, far more energy, uh, far more resources are expended on the Eastern Front than in the West. Um, by the summer of 1944, uh, D-Day, right, when Western allies land at Normandy, very famous landing at Normandy in Northern France, the Soviet Union had been, biting, had been fighting the bulk um, of the Nazi army for three years. 90% um, of the Nazi army is in the East, not in the West. So very important to, to turn our attention to that. Um, in a vein that is uh, similar to the Holocaust, the war in the East blurred the boundaries between civilians and soldiers, right? Um, an enemy is simply an enemy. It doesn't matter if they wear a uniform. Uh, and so the war in the East is a war on all people. Um, it, is a, it, is a, it is simply um, a bloody cauldron that no one can escape. Part of the reason it was so bad is the ideological divide that I've talked about for the past few weeks between communism and fascism. So we have the communist Soviets and their communist allies in Eastern Europe. And we have the fascist Germans and their fascist allies in Eastern Europe, right? So this is sort of a war to end all wars. Um, and these are obviously morally antagonistic uh, ideologies. But another part of the issue, part of the reason it was so bad is that again, so much of Europe's Jewish population is in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union. Um, this, is, this is a mass murder of Jews in Lithuania, a pogrom. Um, one of the things that we see throughout uh, the Eastern Front is communities that don't necessarily have any special affinity for the Nazis, but places where paranoia and anti-Semitism run deep turn on their Jewish neighbors um, with great ferocity. So here we see a pogrom that is instigated and likely encouraged by the Nazis, but in many cases, it is people who've lived alongside one another for hundreds of years who are committing acts of violence against one another and particularly against Jews. Uh -huh. um, and it was also extreme. The, the war in the East was also extreme uh, because the Soviet Union was the huge obstacle, the, the biggest potential obstacle to Hitler's dream of Lebensraum, that, that living space dream. Hitler, since the 1920s, he's imagining clearing all of Eastern Europe and Russia of the people who live there, um, eliminating the Slavs, eliminating the Jews, murdering the communists, and resettling that land with ethnically German people. That is the future that he dreams of. Um, and the Soviets are there. Um, in his way. So in 1941, with Britain um, held at bay, right, the very famous um, aerial raids against uh, Britain um, are happening at this time, uh, and the British are not really operating from a position of strength or an offensive uh, position against the Nazis. The Americans have not entered the war yet. This, that's still six months away. Um, and the rest of Europe is essentially under Nazi control. Hitler decides to violate the non-aggression pact that he had signed with the Soviets, um, and he begins to move his forces to the Soviet border. This is his chance to achieve that dream of expanding east. Uh, were the Soviets ready? Well, yes and no. Um, Stalin's five-year plans had made the USSR 
a huge industrial power. They're prepared in some ways materially for a long and brutal war. But that great purge that I talked about when we discussed Stalinism, the great terror, uh, the, the murder of people within the Soviet regime, um, one of the effects of that was uh, that there was no military command anymore. Stalin had murdered essentially all of uh, his commanders. Uh, there are no real military strategists left, um, which means there's no military leadership in the country anymore um, because Stalin has murdered everybody. Um, so before dawn on, so just quick to sum that point up, the Soviets have some strengths going in, but they are very vulnerable and Hitler recognizes that. Um, he recognizes that they are not in necessarily a position of strength here. So before dawn, June 22nd, 1941, the Nazis launched Operation Barbarossa. This is their invasion of the Soviet Union. Their front, the front of this invasion, um, stretches from the Baltic Sea in the north all the way down to the Carpathian Mountains on the Black Sea in the south. This is uh, a little more than a thousand miles. Uh, it's about the distance from Missoula to Las Vegas or from Minneapolis to New Orleans, right? It's, it's like a continent. Um, that's how vast their fighting front is. Um, and they're organized into three groups. One is going to move north and capture Leningrad, formerly known as St. Petersburg. One is going to move straight into Moscow and one is going to hang south, capture the very fertile, rich agricultural lands of Ukraine, and then move into the oil-rich um, Caucasus region, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, etc. Um, and this is obviously their various routes of attack. Uh, the German army, known as the Wehrmacht, um, their attack is, this is the largest and most powerful military force ever assembled for a single, um, a single attack. There are about 3 million soldiers, um, hundreds of thousands of trucks and horses, thousands of aircrafts and tanks. Again, this is 90% of the German military um, in this one advance. Um, and Hitler is very convinced that this is going to make things quick and easy. Um, he thinks the stifling power is going to quickly crush the Soviets. Um, and he's also confident because he believes the Soviets are weak because they are racially inferior Slavs. Um, and they are also communists, which makes them, he would say, incompetent. In other words, Hitler's ideology is fueling his sense of confidence. This is going to go quickly and it's going to go very well. As he said, we have only to kick in the front door. If we kick in the front door, we're there and it's over. They're never going to be able to stop us. Um, and, and initially he's right. Uh, at the beginning of the war, it goes really well. By December of 41, so now we're six months in, um, they've conquered 500,000 square miles of Soviet territory. That's about the size of the entire American Midwest, from about the Appalachian Mountains um, almost to the Rocky Mountains. Huge, huge territory. Six months they've conquered this. They've imprisoned three million Soviet soldiers. Um, Two million of those will die of starvation within a couple of months. So this is an onslaught um, that is gruesome, it is vicious, and it's quickly successful. Um, and the Stalinist command structure just breaks down initially. Um, there's no unified response from the Red Army. For more than a week, there's no word from Stalin himself. There's no real attempt to mobilize the military in response. Stalin actually had the plans for Operation Barbarossa on his desk months before it happened. Um, he just didn't believe them. He thought it was an attempt by someone within his regime to trick him. Um, uh, he also had many other potentially wrong German plans as well. So it wasn't like he could easily discern which ones were true, or which ones are not, but he did have the plan. Um, and he doesn't necessarily even believe it's happening. He's not sure he trusts uh, intelligence from the front that the Germans are actually invading. Um, so the initial strategy then for the Red Army out on the front is to just retreat um, and scorch the earth behind them, leave nothing in their wake. Um, and essentially, this is the old Russian move, uh, lead their enemy into their own territory. And as the year 
drags on, their enemy will slowly freeze and starve. Um, Stalin does, um, within a few months, begin to accept this is happening. Um, and he begins calling upon the nation to respond. And he does so in some interesting ways, some ways that show, again, Stalin's pivot from the old Marxist ideology and towards something new and something different. Um, some of his rhetoric becomes kind of un-Soviet. Um, you remember Soviets, they're communists. So they, they try to avoid calls for nationalism. They don't really think in terms of ethnicity. They spend most of their time thinking in terms of class and internationalism, universal ideals. Um, but by the fall of 41, Stalin begins proclaiming long live the motherland, right? Classic nationalist language. He weaves these calls uh, in with images of Lenin, um, images of the revolution in 1917, but he also begins um, saying this is a patriotic war and he begins aligning the war effort with the great heroes of Russian history from before, uh, from before the revolution something the Soviets had never done. They had tried to erase that history before. Um, so what he's doing is he's aligning nationalism with socialism. Um, and the predominant image, as you can see from these last two images, becomes the Russian mother, okay? The symbol of the nation. She is calling her sons forth to defeat the Nazi invaders. Um, when Russians refer to World War II, they don't call it World War II, they call it the Great Patriotic War. And it's, it's because of this propaganda effort, right? This is the Great Patriotic Unified Russian effort to defeat an invader. Um, and here you can see, of course, Lenin uh, being appropriated into this propaganda campaign as well. Um, and the Soviet response doesn't just come on a battlefield. It's not just a mobilized military fighting another mobilized military, right? This is an invasion of the homeland, which means everybody, this, is, this goes beyond total war. Um, it is, it's not just a home front supporting soldiers out somewhere else. It's everybody's involved really in the fighting. Um, this is an important point to keep in mind. Remember the five-year plan I talked about that turns the USSR into an industrial superpower? Much of that industrial development was actually in the West, right? It was along that Eastern European border, uh, which is the area the Nazis move into first. So the Soviets, uh, in a sort of superhuman effort, begin moving their industrial capacity further East to get it away from the Nazis so that they can continue producing arms for the war. And this is sort of unbelievable, but what they do is they actually physically move factories. Um, they pick them up brick by brick, they dismantle them, put them on trains, um, and then ship them east and then reassemble them. So uh, by November of 1941, just a few months, uh, about five months after the initial invasion, uh, the Soviets have relocated 1500 um, industrial enterprises from their eastern or from their western border into the Ural Mountains far from the Nazi invasion. About 80% of these are at full capacity by 1942. This is like picking up the city of Detroit or Pittsburgh and moving it to the Rocky Mountains, right? That's essentially what they did. Um, it, it boggles the mind that they were able to do this. And in typical Soviet form, this meant forcibly relocating the people who work in those factories as well, right? So it's not just like picking up the factory and moving it. You then pick up the entire town and move it somewhere else. Um, and then you get it right back to work. Um, and sort of like the famous Rosie the Riveter concept that we see in the US, the Soviets quickly are mobilizing women um, as industrial workers who are essential to the war effort. This is women building um, anti-tank trenches uh, out on the, the Western front of their war. Um, and because the war was in their homeland, women are also fighting it. Okay, so they're not just working sort of behind the scenes to support the effort. They're actually picking up weapons um, and killing, uh, killing Germans. They become partisan fighters, guerrilla fighters. Consider, for example, Zoya um, Kosmodemyanskaya. It's a very long last name. It's difficult for me to pronounce, but I did my best. Um, Zoya is a 17 year old partisan. She's captured by the Nazis uh, and she's murdered. Uh, for never revealing who her collaborators were in a partisan effort to kill them, right? She never gives them up. 
Um, and what she tells them is there's 2 million of us. It doesn't matter who I name because we are all at war with you. So she becomes sort of a saint um, of Soviet uh, iconography. She becomes a hero to the Soviet cause and is sort of worshiped for decades afterwards. Um, she and many, many, many other young teenage women for doing similar things. Um, for civilians under German occupation, life is sort of living hell. Um, the Nazi war, as Hitler said, was a war of annihilation. It's a war to exterminate the inferior people of the East and acquire Lebensraum. So the city of Kharkov in Ukraine, um, which is occupied early on, it loses nearly half of its population um, to starvation as well as the violence. Um, thousands of its citizens are sent to death camps, thousands more forcibly relocated for slave labor, uh, which is how the German wartime economy functioned. Um, the toll of human suffering on the Eastern Front, the sort of combination of military and civilian casualties is almost impossible to imagine. Um, it's really hard to wrap your mind around it instead of just thinking about it in terms of statistics. The Soviet army lost about 12 million men, um, in addition to between 15 and 20 million civilian casualties. So we're talking about a range from about 25 to 32 million Soviet deaths on the Eastern Front. Um, and just for comparison, US and British deaths in the Second World War are about 750,000 combined. All right, so it's about, um, it's a little more than 30 times more uh, the casualty rate on the Eastern Front. There's no family in the Soviet Union that isn't uh, badly damaged by the war, no family. Um, and so you can see why it's referred to as the Great Patriotic War, right? It forces everybody to become, uh, to struggle for the nation's survival as well as their own survival. Um, by 1959, so now we're talking almost 15 years after the war's over, there's 20 million more women than men uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, and the country also lost about 60% of its Jewish population. Um, as I said, it, it's almost impossible to fathom the scale of suffering on the Eastern Front. Uh, by the autumn of 1941, the Nazis had encircled Leningrad. They began a 900 day siege on the city. Um, uh, more than, this is Leningrad during the war uh, in this picture here. More than 1 million civilians would die, most from starvation. Um, yet, by December of 1941, all of the momentum that the Nazis initially have after uh, implementing Operation Barbarossa, uh, it begins to slow. Uh, and where it begins to really uh, get stuck in the mud is not far from Moscow. Um, German soldiers had been very confident the German military command had been very confident that this was going to be a quick and short war. So they don't have gear for the winter. They're not prepared. Um, they're trying to coordinate a war effort over um, about a 2,000 mile long front of soldiers now as they've spread out into Eastern Europe. Um, and then that front itself is thousands of miles from Berlin. So trying to maintain um, uh, proper gear and trying to keep everybody fed and trying to keep everybody armed is uh, almost impossible. Um, the Soviet death rate is much higher than the German death rate, but the Soviets are just finding more and more people, right? They're conscripting millions and millions of soldiers from the Far East, right? The Soviet Union stretches to the Pacific um, from Central Asia, um, and they begin to push back against German advances and in the Battle of Moscow in December of 1941, they repel the Germans um, and this really begins to turn the tide of the war. Um, and this is a fatal blow in a sense for the Soviets because if, they, if it wasn't quick and easy, or for the Nazis I should say, if it wasn't quick and easy, then they were gonna get bogged down and if they got bogged down, um, they would become encircled by the allies on the West. So it was a really a life or death um, move for them, even though it's going to be four more years of war. Um, they, their hope of winning the war uh, declines dramatically once they can't defeat the Soviets quickly and easily. 
Um, this is a monument in contemporary Moscow called the Last Defense Line Monument, um, which shows the furthest that the Germans were able to reach into uh, Russia uh, or towards Moscow before they were turned back. The next major turning point is the Battle of Stalingrad, which is in August of 1942. It stretches into the winter of 43. Again, the Germans are repelled. Um, and after this, they're very badly weakened. Um, and there's, there are never um, a German, there is never a German offensive on the Eastern Front again after Stalingrad. So from 1943 forward, we see the Soviets take the offensive. Okay, the war shifts. It's no longer a war of German invasion into the Soviet Union, it, it's a reverse. It's a Soviet offensive pushing the Germans out of the Soviet Union and back to uh, Berlin. Um, and and this, is, this is a very ugly time. Um, in response to all of the horrors that the Nazis have perpetrated um, as they invaded East, uh, the Soviet attack, counterattack is ferocious. It is utterly without mercy. Um, Stalin tells his people in 1942, you cannot defeat an enemy without having learned to hate him from the bottom of your heart. Um, you see this propaganda poster from 1942, which captures this spirit, right? A small child with her mother dead behind her, her town burned, her village burned, and it says, father, kill the German, right? Or this woman standing above her daughter's corpse proclaiming, we will destroy the fascist cannibals. As the Soviet uh, journalist Ilya Ehrenberg uh, put it, we shall not speak anymore. We shall not get excited. We shall kill. If you have not killed at least one German a day, you have wasted that day. Okay, this is the, this is the spirit of the Soviet people. Um, from 1942 forward. And the Soviets turn this rage against the Nazi army as well as ethnic Germans who lived throughout Eastern Europe, some of whom had been resettled by the Nazis and many of whom had just been there for centuries. Um, and they displace um, roughly 7 million Germans from throughout Eastern Europe and they kill uh, roughly 3 million of them. Um, the Eastern Front uh, amid the German offensive and the Soviet counteroffensive and the annihilation of civilians is completely soaked in blood. Um, it, it, as I've said a number of times throughout this lecture, it, it's, it's beyond imagination. Um, in 1944, uh, especially after the Western Allies invade Northern France um, and draw Nazi attention to the West. The Soviets are closing in on Berlin um, and it's only a matter of time before the Nazi regime collapses. Uh, from the summer of 44 to the spring of 45, um, the Soviets in the East and the Allies in the West begin, and the Western Allies, begin converging on Berlin um, and they meet there uh, in April of 1945 at the Elbe River just outside of Berlin. Here we have an American and a Soviet soldier greeting one another. Um, obviously this is before the Cold War sets in. This is East meeting West. Um, Hitler commits suicide in April um, with the Soviets right on the doorstep of Berlin. Um, here we see the Soviet flag raised. This is one of the most famous images from the war. The Soviet flag raised above Berlin. Um, and on May 9th, 1945, uh, the Germans sign unconditional surrender and the war in Europe is over. Um, Hitler's thousand year Reich, as he often called it, uh, has collapsed in 12 years. Um, and the great patriotic war for the Soviets provides this new founding myth of Soviet civilization. It's almost as if the Soviet Union is born again out of this horrific experience. Um, this is the crucible through which Soviet socialism has been tested and it's been hardened and the Soviets are now um, a superpower in the world. The losses though, um, to be clear, the losses uh, from the war reverberate even today in the Soviet Union. And it would be impossible for them not to after all I've just described. Um, but as we begin to discuss the Cold War, right, this tension between 
the Western world, especially the United States and its allies in Western Europe, and the communist Soviet, the communist world as, as sort of dictated by the Soviet Union. I want you to keep this in mind, okay, because th that is not merely an ideological struggle. It's also a struggle that's informed by what happened on the Eastern Front, and it's impossible to understand the Soviet position in the Cold War without thinking about the scale um, of suffering on the Eastern Front. Okay, that's all I've got for now. Um, thanks for watching, everybody, and I will talk to you soon.